In this lesson, we'll examine how the process of natural selection can produce new species. Darwin argued that natural selection not only uh, produces adaptations in one species, but also it had the power to generate a new species from a previously existing species. The example we'll use will involve insects again. So here we see a stick insect. Notice its body looks like a stick, and that would be good camouflage in an environment that had plant stems and things and sticks. Here we see a, a larger species of stick insect, and when you look at it this way, you can even see, here's the body here, you can even see on the legs of this stick insect are little thorn-like appendages. So this would provide excellent camouflage on plants that had thorns on their uh, stems. So this is the stick insect. Now we'll, we'll take a look at another kind of insect, and here we're going to call this a leaf insect. Clearly, it is well camouflaged for an environment filled with leaves. So here we see the body, so its wings look like leaves. Here's its head, and even the front uh, appendages here kind of look like uh, leaves there. So this uh, animal will be difficult to spot uh, in a leafy environment. In fact, if you look closer up on its on its uh, on its back there, the, the wings there, they even have veins, sort of like what you would find in leaves. So this is excellent camouflage. Now, William Paley, the Christian thinker in Darwin's time, would have said, well, this is the work of an intelligent mind, that these leaf insects were created by God, and they always looked like this. And Darwin's going to di uh, disagree, fundamentally. He's going to argue this kind of adaptation evolved over time. So the ancestors of this leaf insect did not look like leaves. They looked like something else, and this trait evolved, so it had a natural history. So our task will be to see how natural selection can help us understand how a, a, an ancestral species, one species, might evolve into two separate species. Now, we're not suggesting that these two particular species had a, a very recent common ancestor, uh, but we're just going to uh, use these two to illustrate the idea of how natural selection can be part of the answer for how new species evolve. So the story begins then with some ancestral population of insects, and here they're depicted as sort of having, you know, bodies and maybe a little bit of variation in color, but presumably they lived in some environment and they were doing well enough that they're still around. So there were predators in that environment, but uh, still they were surviving and, and making offspring and, and existing from generation to generation. Um, but let's imagine now, due to uh, limitations of food or competition in their original environment, some of them are venturing out to explore new environments. Some of them enter into a more leafy environment, and some of these individuals enter into a more stick-like environment. So this is the key, the key uh, triggering process for Darwin. When one species gets separated into two separate environments, we have the potential for the evolution of, uh, of uh, two species. Let's see how that would work. First of all, it is not the case that just because these individuals are going into a stick-like environment that somehow that stick, stick environment is going to change their genetic material so that these parents will only have babies that look like sticks. So we don't want to say that the new environment is causing the variations. The new environment does not cause useful variations. Neither up here do, does the leafy environment somehow change the genetic material in a way that makes these parents have only leaf-like babies. That's not how biologists understand the process. Rather, the variations, the new offspring, are going to show variations that are random with respect to the uh, environment. Now, let's, what does that uh, new variation look like? Well, up here, notice we have some different colorations and body shapes and body sizes. And we'll call this random variation because the offspring, maybe some of them uh, look a little bit more like a leaf, but others don't. So, uh, for example, this one up here is still red, and this one's red. And, and in a green leafy environment, that really stands out. Predators that are in that environment will easily see those individuals and eat them. Notice, by eating the ones that they see, they are leaving behind the ones that they don't see as well. So any variation that provides a little extra camouflage will have a survival advantage. And because uh, they are surviving more often than the ones who are obviously disappeared by being lunch for the predator, the ones who survive are going to be the parents. And if that trait is heritable, then the future uh, generations are going to have more of these useful traits in those populations. 
Down here in the stick environment, it's the same type of thing. Notice we've, we've shown here sort of a similar type of variation. It's just that now what counts as good camouflage is different. It's better to be a little on the thin side, right, and maybe a little darker color. That will give you a survival advantage. Here, the green one, which would have been useful up in this environment, is penalized. It can be easily seen by the predators and will be eaten. They will lose the struggle for existence, and this red one over here also got eaten. So down here in the stick environment, it's the same kinds of predators doing the selecting, see, but just which traits uh, provide the survival advantage is different. So in the leafy environment, it's the leaf-like bodies that uh, have the survival advantage. In the stick environment, it's the stick-like bodies that have the survival advantage. Now it's important to note that individuals are not evolving. It's populations that are evolving. Uh, so, for example, this one here, this green one here, it was born that way. It did not start out as a red bug, and then just because it kind of looked around and said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm in a, a bunch of leaves here that I'm going to turn green. No, that's not how uh, this works. So they're born with some kind of trait, and that trait is due to their uh, particular uh, genetic information. Uh, but rather, the population will be evolving because having that better camouflage compared to others will mean that they will pass on that trait and future populations will have more of the useful green camouflage. Down here in the stick environment, it's the same story. Um, it's not that this individual uh, began its life on the large size and then somehow over time got thin so as to be better camouflaged. No, it was born this way with a body shape like that. And as a result of that uh, genetic variation, it has the advantage. Now, let's imagine natural selection is operating in these two environments for thousands and thousands and thousands of generations. Over time, then, uh, we're going to find that uh, most of the insects in that environment will have a good camouflage. And up here, that means they're going to look like leaves. And down here, it means they're going to look like sticks. So we would say now, uh, by this time, we have a species-wide adaptation. And this is often what we find. Because uh, when we look at animal populations, well, they've been around a long time, says Darwin. They've had time to evolve adaptations uh, to fit their environments, their local environments. But of course, every generation, there's new variation. And this is just a fact about reproduction. Uh, Darwin didn't understand DNA, but we now know that when uh, uh, individuals reproduce, there are new mutations, there's shuffling of the genetic information, and so we get variation in the offspring. Now, if a leaf insect has an offspring that does not look like a leaf, well, then it's going to be eaten by predators, and that's why we don't see the f the the experiments. We, we see really just the well-adapted individuals. Uh, those individuals that don't look like leaves up here are going to be easily eaten and eliminated, and they will not pass on that uh, unfavorable trait. Same down here. Uh, some of these stick insects are going to have offspring that maybe look less like a stick than they did. Well, those individuals are going to be penalized by natural selection. They will be eaten by predators. So selection will sort of maintain whatever traits uh, are, uh, are adaptive for that environment and penalize any traits that deviate from that good camouflage. Now let's imagine selection has been operating here again for thousands and thousands of generations. If these populations uh, were isolated in this way for any length of time, what we're going to call that sort of reproductive isolation. It means that individuals in this population were just breeding with each other up here, and individuals down here were, were mating with individuals here. If there was no interbreeding, then we have a situation where genetic differences can accumulate, and that can prevent any later uh, reproduction. Um, to make fertile offspring. So if, if, if sometime later we took a male here and a female here and, uh, and tried to mate them, that would be n unsuccessful. At that point, if they do not breed successfully, we would say they are separate species. So we're going to define sort of a species as an interbreeding population that can produce fertile offspring. These individuals had been mating with uh, themselves for a long time. These individuals mating with their population for a while. They were not interbreeding, so we're calling that reproductive isolation. And that allowed new genetic differences to accumulate such that at a later time they would not be able to reproduce together. And then we would say we have separate species. 
So to summarize then, we started with one species, but because uh, individuals of one species were separated into two different environments with different selection pressures, uh, we have the evolution of different adaptations, and sufficient time passed that uh, they become genetically distinct so they cannot interbreed. We have now the production of two species. Notice uh, that there was no intelligence uh, required in the production of this uh, fine camouflage up here. Right, so Paley would have said, well, this would require an intelligent mind. Darwin says, no, natural selection produces uh, adaptations. But in addition, Darwin's going to say natural selection can increase the number of species as a result of one species being subject to do two different kinds of selection factors. In the leafy environment, it's predators and the leafy environment that combine to favor leaf-like bodies. In the stick environment, it's predators and the stick environment that combine to favor stick-like bodies. So we have the appearance of design. It looks like the body shape here was designed by an intelligent mind, but uh, we have the appearance of design, but it's not actually designed from an intelligent mind. Rather, it's a non-intelligent natural process that produced animals with the appearance of design without a mind. So we'll just take one more quick example. Here is the sort of common uh, praying mantis we might see around outside. Um, here's a, an interesting uh, species of mantis. It, its body looks like leaves. So there are, these are two mantises, two separate species of mantises. One of them has the familiar body shape, but this one has, a, has a, a, an interesting adaptation. They are two different species, and the idea is they can trace their ancestry back to a common ancestor. It's just that some of those individuals ultimately went on to evolve into this species, and others went on to evolve into this species. Perhaps, again, this, this group here uh, entered into an environment where there were stronger predator selection processes, and the nature of the, the leaves in the environment set up uh, a selection so that uh, this type of body trait had an advantage. Whereas over here, these individuals were getting along fine, looking like this. So Darwin's going to argue that, that this, is, uh, this has been going on for a long time. Recall in his notebook, he sketched out this idea of common ancestors branching into multiple species. Now, just take this basic idea of selection operating on different populations in different ways, and we can now just kind of uh, magnify that over the course of hundreds of millions of years, and we get this idea of the tree of life. When one uh, branch, when one sort of uh, branch of the tree splits into two branches, that's this idea of natural selection generating two different species from one species. So this is why the tree metaphor is so important, because it captures this idea of a natural process, natural selection, with the power to create new species from already existing species. And why, why so many different species? Well, the idea is, just as we saw here, the animals uh, kind of moving into new environments, this is what animals and plants do. There's constant uh, migration, uh, and, and there's constant evolution of new species, and this changes environments. So the dynamic aspect of a complex ecosystem will uh, give natural selection lots of opportunities uh, to produce uh, new species from previously existing species.